these weathered panels and faded paint are part of the legacy of the Nevada, California, Oregon Railway that has amazingly survived. These ghostly structures provide us an evocative image of what we would have seen a century ago on the Lakeview Branch. Even though there is nothing glamorous or provocative about them, nevertheless, one cannot help but be overcome with a surreal back-tingling sensation when standing next to something crafted so elegantly by hand from another time and indeed another age. These cars are part of a growing collection of NCO rolling stock, and their rescue is credited to the valiant efforts of the NCO Historical Society, who has managed to save these surviving cars with plans to fully restore each of them to full cosmetic and operational condition. The Nevada, California, Oregon Railway has been considered the longest narrow gauge line built in the 20th century, reaching a total length of 238 miles from Reno, Nevada in the south to Lakeview, Oregon in the north. As with all railroad ventures of that time, the plans were expansive, with the final terminus aimed to be in the Dalles, Oregon, some 300 miles further north from Lakeview, as well as branch lines extending west to Kalamath Falls and the Willamette Valley. However, as many such plans would go, they were only in the end, a dream. Recapping from part one, the NCO finally reached Alturas in 1908 after 30 years, and needless to say, the town benefited greatly from the arrival of the long-anticipated line. 1917 would mark the peak of the NCO's empire and the start of the line's decline, when it was decided to sell off the lower 64 miles of their system to the Western Pacific, who were building their Feather River route through the Sierra Nevadas. This would mean losing their headquarters and shop facilities in Reno, which were all relocated to Alturas in 1918, changing the town from a stop on the line into the railway's hub. The NCO would build workshops, locomotive facilities, a roundhouse, offices, as well as crew houses, adding to the existing freight and passenger depots. The NCO built several of these structures out of more expensive brick and stone, which would have taken more from their bottom line, but due to this, most of these buildings have survived the harsh climate of the region and can still be seen around the town today. One such structure is the original depot, built in 1908, which today stands where it was relocated to in 1915 from its first location on the site next to 12th Street. It was moved here in order to be closer to the center of town, which also placed it next to the freight depot. That same year, the freight depot would burn down, leaving the site bare, and is where East Street now passes over the line. The replacement freight depot is believed to still stand a few blocks up the line, and is thought to be the one transferred from Surprise Station. Though having seen some modification over time, this building now serves a new purpose as a warehouse. From here, on the other side of the tracks, stands the imposing headquarters building for the railway we first saw as our train entered the town the day before. In the neighboring plot, standing in stark contrast, sits an unassuming building which can easily be overlooked. However, this is the last surviving of five crew houses built by the NCO, two of which were built here. The second matching house stood to the right, but was sadly lost in more recent years. In an image taken at the time, we can see the NCO's headquarters, along with the two crew houses to the right. This shows how little there was when the railway arrived, with the land having been filled up over time as the town grew. Of more interest for us, however, is what we see at the bottom of the image. Here we can see trackage passing behind these buildings, which led from the main line along what is today 5th Street and is seen fanning out into several spurs to the left of shot. This open lot behind the headquarters is where these spurs were leading into and was the location the NCO chose to build its roundhouse and workshops. From above, we can still make out the outline of the roundhouse along with the inspection pits and the location of the turntable. To the left of the roundhouse's location, we can see a small stone structure, which was the original pump house for the facilities. Since filming this scene, the structure has sadly been partially dismantled. Bordering the open lot on the right stands a metal-clad warehouse, with more to it than first appearances would reveal. Looking along the base, we see the stone foundations of what remains of the NCO's workshops. The superstructure was lost in a fire, leaving only the foundations. 
Over the course of the NCO's existence, it would own 23 locomotives, with its on-duty roster being at its highest with 13. Eight would survive into Southern Pacific ownership before the line would be widened to standard gauge. On a final point of interest before we depart Alturas is at the Modoc County Historical Museum at the south end of town. Here we find Southern Pacific number 2718, a consolidation 280 built for the Southern Pacific by Baldwin in 1904 and served the SP for 52 years, being retired in November of 1956 and donated to the museum. One of only three surviving C8 class locomotives, this unit was on roster for the Lakeview branch between 1927 and 1938. Now picking up where we left off in part one, the Goose Lake Railway crew have returned to Alturas to collect their inbound train and make the run back to Lakeview. On another clear, cold morning, we find the crew having hooked onto the inbound train brought in by the Union Pacific, whose power we can see behind, tied down with the cars they brought in the day before. The Y that we see here, along with the yard tracks running southward, were all added by the Southern Pacific as part of the building of their infamous Modoc line from Klamath Falls, Oregon, joining into the existing NCO line here from the west that was completed in 1929. All trackage south of the yard has since been abandoned, with much of the rail being torn out and reused on the Lakeview branch. Though it has changed several times over the course of the branch line's ownership, Today, this is where cars are interchanged with the Union Pacific from the Goose Lake Railway, as well as being used as storage for both the Goose Lake and the Union Pacific. Once departing the yard, the crew begins to make its way through the town's back streets, where we see it roll by the NCO passenger depot, standing next to the line it served for so many decades. Gets the train a couple more times as the crew makes their way around the north end of town, turning eastward towards the Warner Mountains.
standing at a vantage point above the North Pitt River. We wait for number 614 as it makes its way along Highway 395 and enters the south end of the Pitt River Valley. In the background, we can just make out the inspection station on Highway 395. From here, we can see the grade as the track begins to climb up the valley. By the 1920s, the Morin brothers, the then owners of the NCO, found themselves in a critical financial situation and in need of rescue from impending bankruptcy. Rescue would come in 1925 from the Southern Pacific, who intended to use the NCO line as part of a diversionary route that would become known as the Affirmation Modoc Line. As mentioned, they would build from Kalamath Falls, joining the NCO tracks in Alturas, and head south to the then southern terminus of the NCO at Wendell. From there, they would build a new alignment eastward along Pyramid Lake to join their tracks at Fernley, Nevada. A deal was signed and the Southern Pacific took over operations in 1926, keeping the NCO name on all the rolling stock until 1929, when the NCO name was finally retired. This coincided with the completion of the Modoc Line, and with the line from Alturas to Lakeview becoming Southern Pacific's Lakeview branch. When the SP took control in 1926, they soon converted the line to standard gauge between 1927 and 1928. This consequently resulted in all the narrow gauge rolling stock becoming redundant, with the majority being sent to the Southern Pacific's Lone Pine Branch in California's remote Owens Valley, with what was left being sold off. At Surprise Station, we are looking southward this time for the approach of our train. As we do, we notice a unique rock formation standing next to the right of way. Referred to as Chimney Rock, this once formed part of a homestead built by Thomas Denson in 1871. Still clear today is the vertical cut in the rock which formed the chimney that gives this formation its name. In an old photo, the course of the chimney is clear to see with the fireplace at its base. We can also make out where the walls and roof timbers would have been inset into the rock face. No longer part of a home, Chimney Rock now forms part of a backdrop as the Goose Lake crew rolls past. Surprise Station, the grade increases to 1% as we enter into the Pit River Canyon. Further into the Pit River Canyon, 
we look up from the tranquil waters of the Pitt River itself as the tranquility is drowned out by the combined sound of 3,000 iron horses working their way up to 1% grade. Having cleared the canyon, our train is once again on level ground and closing in on Davis Creek. Between the 1930s and 40s, the line would see a decline in livestock traffic, which had been the main export for many years, but on the other hand, would see an increase in lumber production with as many as seven mills based in Lakeview. At first, Southern Pacific ran two locals based out of Alturas that would depart alternating days for Lakeview, going up one day and returning the next. They would meet each other at Willow Ranch roughly halfway. This was then changed to have one turn based out of Alturas and the other in Lakeview, who would meet at Willow Ranch to swap trains and return to their respective depots. The 1950s would bring further change as the long established lumber industry in Lakeview had begun to dwindle with many of the mills shutting down for good. SP's response was to drop the turn based out of Lakeview and run the other out of Alturas six days a week. Then by the 1980s, with the closure of the Modoc line and the continued decline of carloads, the SP was running a twice-weekly three-day round trip out of Klamath Falls to service the customers on the line. By 1983, there were less than 1,500 carloads in total resulting in the SP viewing the line as a lost cause and filing for abandonment in 1984. The Lake County government, however, were not about to lose their only rail connection that was critical for the local economy, and they approached the Southern Pacific about taking over the line. Despite the line's abandonment being approved in August of 1985, the Southern Pacific agreed to continue operating until a deal could be finalized, which happened shortly after, with the Lake County purchasing the branch for a sum of $550,000 in January of 1986. Now this may on the surface seem a straightforward process, but the county had no money to spend on such an expense and there were laws that prohibited local governments from owning land outside of their state. The state legislator then enacted a law allowing local counties to own railroads outside of the state and 85% of the funds would come from the Oregon Lottery, with the rest being raised from local businesses. Once again, the line was saved from complete abandonment. Halfway to the border with Oregon, we arrive back in Davis Creek once again. The NCO would reach here in 1911 and would build a sizable depot, which sadly has not survived. The first train to arrive in Davis Creek received much fanfare and was recorded in these images taken on that day, showing everyone in their Sunday best. Standing on West Side Road, we are able to see down the long section of straight track as we patiently await the train. The empty lot next to us is where the depot was built, and as we can see, no trace of its existence remains. Between 1908 and 1912, Goose Lake would reach its highest recorded level at a depth of 25 feet, with the water's southern edge reaching Davis Creek, where a ferry port was built to ferry people and goods to and from Lakeview, Oregon, prior to the arrival of the railroad. William Brewster Jr. built a ferry, naming it Lakeside, for the Oregon Valley Land Company, who at the time were trying to entice settlers to the valley and save them the 70 mile walk around the lake's edge, cutting the journey in half. 
The ferry, however, inevitably became a casualty of both the railroad and the lake itself. When a combination of the line's completion to Lakeview and the lake's receding boundary in 1912 made the ferry redundant. north of Davis Creek, we look west and see the plateau on the distant side of the Goose Lake Valley. Here we are able to get a full broadside of our train as it cuts through the middle ground. This run is not always double headed, but rather only when it is necessary such as with today's train of 23 cars. When able to, the Goose Lake will only use a single unit for the run to Alturas and back. Sugar Hill, the line passes a location referred to as Easton. The name only appears on a couple of maps, with no town having ever been here. The only feature is this cutting which we see our train passing through. Looking at the dry landscape, snow is certainly not the first thing you would think of. However, the Goose Lake Basin is at a high enough elevation to receive a good layer of snow every year. Indeed, this provided a challenge one year for the NCO crews here at Easton as their train became snowed in as documented for us in these pictures. Standing atop the promontory now, we look south viewing the progress of our train as it makes its way through the curves along the historic shoreline of the Goose Lake. Seeing the promontory from the air, we get a much better appreciation of this geological feature and its scale as 614 negotiates around its base. We can also see Highway 395 as it climbs up and over the promontory above the rail below. Having returned to Willow Ranch, we are on the ground this time as our train moseys into town. When we first passed through Willow Ranch, we previously spoke of the lumber mill that once dominated this site. This location, as previously mentioned, also served as the midway point in the height of the Southern Pacific days of operation, with the siding here along with many spurs servicing the lumber mill. Today we find only a short spur remains next to the line.
With the event of Lake County purchasing the Lakeview Branch from the Southern Pacific, the Great Western Railway out of Colorado would take on the contract for operating the line on the 18th of January, 1986, the day after the Southern Pacific would run their last train. However, traffic continued to dwindle with only two lumber mills left by 1991. In an attempt to grow business, the railroad tried trucking lumber down from Burns, Oregon. This was soon found to be unfeasible. After the 10-year contract was up, the GWR left and the county decided to run the railroad itself, creating the Lake County Railroad in 1996 and bought one of the locomotives from the GWR. Timing though was not on their side, as one more mill closed its doors, leaving a solitary lumber mill as the line's only customer. Combined with the Union Pacific's takeover of the Southern Pacific in the same year, led to an inability to get cars for the line. Now limited to one train a week, the line once again was within days of having to shut down. However, salvation came in the final hours in the form of a Perlot mine located north of Lakeview, near Paisley, that had been trying to get off the ground for a few years and was in need of a rail link to ship their Perlite. This quite literally saved the line and placed it back on firm financial footing, allowing for much needed track maintenance, including the salvaging of several miles of heavier rail from the abandoned Modoc line for reuse on the branch. Just before the state border lies the location of what was the community of Fairport. The community would see a boom with the arrival of the railroad in 1912, bringing about the installation of a post office in the same year. The town was known for its resort by the lake and for being a base for miners exploring the Warner Mountains. With the railroad, the town would also become a transload site for cattle and lumber. By the time of the Great Depression, Fairport would no longer exist on maps as a result of the diminishing of Goose Lake and the end of mining in the region over the decade prior. Here, 614 passes by. What residents remain after all this time? Half a mile further north, we reach the state border. Here we look on as 614 makes its way towards us as it crosses into Oregon. Goose Lake State Park is located here, with paths leading out to Goose Lake proper, reached by a paved road which lies on top of the border between the two states. Reaching the north end of Goose Lake, the crew crosses over Old Wells Road, and the landscape around them opens up to expansive pasture land. With the distant ridgeline as our backdrop, the train is made to appear very lonely indeed. Almost as if it were a mirage, we spot Lakeview in the distance for the first time. The final destination for us and the Goose Lake crew. Looking south from Crane Creek Road, the sun is now high in the sky as the crew closes in on Lakeview. The dry terrain and mountain backdrop creates a scene found throughout much of the western ranges, much of which the Southern Pacific covered in their heyday.
Lake County Railroad would operate until 2005, when the Modoc Northern took over until 2009, followed by Frontier Rail from 2009 to 2017 under the name of Lake Railway. Both would be booted from the line by the county, leaving them in need of a new operator. A bid was opened and the Goose Lake Railway was chosen. Formed in partnership between the Pearlite Company, Cornerstone Industrial Minerals, and Next Logistics, the Goose Lake Railway would take over operations in 2017. For a time, they operated out the Perez, which was a holdover from the Frontier Rail era, but this ended in 2019 with the Union Pacific taking back the line from Perez to Alturas. Closing in on our final destination, the town of Lakeview grows ever bigger in the distance, but more importantly for our story, we can also see the new Red Rock Biofuels facility that is currently under construction just south of the town. This facility is big news for the community of Lakeview and for the county at large. Being the first new customer for the railroad in many years, Red Rock Biofuels plans to produce both jet and diesel fuels from timber slash piles created as part of the local forest management, which would otherwise be burned away. This plant would be the first of its kind in the world, and even better, will ship out processed fuels by rail for distribution, helping secure the line's future for years to come. Having returned to where we started two days ago, we now view the arrival of our train back into Lakeview. To the left of the train, we can make out the chain link fence that surrounds the new Red Rock facility site. The spur connects to the main track just behind the train as we see it. back at their home base, the crew's work is not over yet, as they will take their train towards the industries in the north part of town and proceed to switch them out with the cars they have brought with them for the week ahead. As they continue onward, we will take a quick look at the town of Lakeview before rejoining them. Lakeview holds the title as the tallest town in Oregon, sitting at an elevation of over 4,800 feet and is home for over 2,400 people, constituting a quarter of Lake County's population. The town was founded in 1876 after a vote had been held to decide upon the permanent county seat for the newly formed Lake County created out of land from neighboring Jackson and Wasco counties in 1874. W.M. Bullard settled on the town site in 1869 at the mouth of Bullard Canyon on Bullard Creek and donated 20 acres for the building of the town's courthouse. Bullard would then sell another 300 acres on which the town of Lakeview was built. Today, the center of town is close to where Bullard had first settled. Now we find a bustling main street with rows of storefronts, a movie theater, and the Hayford Building built in 1913, which is on the National Registry of Historic Buildings. The Nevada, California, Oregon Railway would run its first train into Lakeview in January of 1912, which after 30 years of building would become the company's most northern terminus. Many original structures have since disappeared from the early days of the railway's presence in Lakeview, being demolished or succumbing fire, but one important building has survived. The NCO's Lakeview Depot stands as it has for over a hundred years, next to the main line a few hundred feet from the Goose Lake Railway's depot of today. Now a private residence, this unique depot still proudly displays its location above the entryway, as the eaves and bay window designs give away the building's original purpose. At the north end of town, our train passes over 4th Street, 
entering what can be considered Lakeview's industrial area. Passing old industry spurs used for car storage, as well as a Y, we see one of the line's two customers, Collins Lumber Mill. The Collins have been in the lumber business for five generations, going back to the 1850s, and it would be in 1944 when the family business would buy the Lakeview Lumber Company and the mill on this site. A second mill would follow with both succumbing to fire, with the first mill being rebuilt as what we see today. This lifelong customer of the railroad ships out processed lumber along with wood chips for Georgia Pacific, heading to mills such as the ones located in Toledo, Oregon. A little further north, we see the crews spotting cars for the line's other customer we spoke of before, Cornerstone Industrial Minerals and their Perlite operation. This transload facility, located next to a customer once served by the railroad, Pacific Pine Products, allows for perlite quarried several miles north of here to be loaded into hoppers for shipment nationwide. Ground up for shipping, this lightweight rock is exceptionally useful with applications from cosmetics to construction and filtration systems, such as those used for beer before bottling. It is here that we leave the Goose Lake crew to their switching duties and arrive at the end of our journey. Although coined as the Northern California Outrage, the NCO nevertheless became a critical part of both Lake and Modoc counties. Having traveled with us over our 110 mile journey, covering over 160 years of history, we hope that you too have come into a new appreciation of not only the NCO and the Goose Lake Railway, but also of the communities that we have seen along the way that depend on this line. Today we see the line once more reaching a turning point in its history, however, not one of decline as it has been in the past, but rather one of growth. For as we have seen, new traffic flows are coming to the line, as well as an increase of production from current customers. New investment is also coming, with scheduled projects to rehabilitate the track, plus talk of a transload facility in Lakeview. It just goes to show that with the right determined people behind them, Little lines like these can continue to survive despite the odds. We would especially like to thank the NCO Historical Society for allowing us access to their collection of rolling stock and its inclusion in this film. If you would like to support the Society's work, you can find them online on their website and subscribe to their quarterly newsletter, the links of which will also be in the description below. We hope that you have enjoyed our feature on the Goose Lake Railway's Lakeview Line. Be sure to subscribe for future content and from all of us at Sidetracked, thank you.